At the westernmost limits of Britain sit two proud neighbours, shaped by the sea. Devon, a luscious county boasting two national parks. Proper people, proper county, proper cream tea. Yes. And hundreds of miles of dramatic coast. Grew up, lived up, loved up. Everything about Devon, I love. And across the River Tamar, Cornwall. Yeah! The ancient granite kingdom of Kurnow thrusting out into the Atlantic. I have traveled the world, but I always come home. Where old ways enrich the new. Right, Bill, get up. It's a very special place, been here for 100 years. Millions of visitors head west each year. Some choose to stay for good. It's just so unbelievably varied. I love that feeling of freedom. This is my little bit of heaven in Devon. Whether born here or drawn here, there are still many deep-rooted folk. Always looking at the judge. Proudly holding on to their heritage and creating their own future. I love the ocean and to be part of something which is within our county's history. You have to keep working hard to stay here, but we're glad we're here. These are the stories of the people who call Devon and Cornwall home. Newquay on the North Cornish coast. It looks the Atlantic face on, with its stunning beaches and craggy coves. And its picturesque harbour is still the beating heart of the local community. Halfway along the rugged northern shore, Newquay has a rich and proud heritage just below the surface. A town with fishing hooked deep in its DNA. As it is for Phil Trebilcock, for whom the sea is both workplace and wonderland. Good lobster weather, calm and you know, no swell in the waters. Better day here and a bad day in the office. <laughs> Phil's been a fisherman for over 40 years. He goes out for lobster and crab. And today, he's on course for one of his busiest and favorite times of the year. We got a nice day there, look at that. Okay. What, what more do you want? Sunshine, flat cow, good company, what's wrong with that? Like many a Cornishman, Phil has always been up to his elbows in fishing and all the tackle that goes with it. Well, I left school at uh, 16, and in the evenings, weekends, it was Den Arbor, and catching a few mackerel and selling a few mackerel, and uh, made a few quid, and as they say, been here ever since. Where else do you want to be? For generations, it was the huge pilchard shoals that gave Cornish fishermen meat, money, and light all in one night. But tastes have changed, and the modern appetite for fine dining has given Phil and his fellow mariners a new fish to fry. Nice Cornish lobster. The A size, I think. Let's have a look. From the eye socket, the carapace length. Must be 90 mil. He's about 91 or two. So we keep that one. Yeah, lobster is nice, but for what you pay for it, it's a bit overrated. Myself, I'd rather have an ordinary white crab sandwich. I wouldn't pay 25 quid for a lobster or more. Probably 50 in London. The lion's share of Phil's catch goes up the line to top restaurants in the home counties. But there's a festive event on the horizon, a chance to keep his haul this side of the Tamar. For the past 17 years, Phil has helped organize the annual Newquay Fish Festival, a time to proudly show off his wares much closer to home. Well, that's, uh, I started the fish festival and it's got very big now, but it brings 8, 10,000 people to the harbor over three days. 
back at the harbour, it's time to land this morning's harvest. Low mileage lobsters. Yeah, local. Is that it? Come the evening, and Phil's got a very different song to sing. The festival is just days away. He's both an organiser and the mainstay of the entertainment. Phil's a leading light in Newquay Rowing Club Singers, which always headlines the event. Yeah, we'll sing frivolous songs and whatever they want to do, and you never know what you're going to get with this gang. It's a chance for one and all to connect with Cornwall's strong heritage of singing and remind this picturesque fishing port of its distinctive legacy. Uh, After three? <laughs> yeah, right, three. <laughs> the way I sing of Cornwall, there's one way to begin To tell the story of the men of copper, fish and tin uh, Just a couple of shandy songs about fishing farming as well, mining songs, and it brings people down, and not just visitors, a lot of local people come down who very rarely come down the harbour now, so it's very community orientated. Let's hear it for Trevithick, with his engine steaming by. With everyone in fine voice, it'll soon be time to give it belting at the Fish Festival finale. North Devon. Sweeping in from the ocean, rugged cliffs force the sea air skyward. And beyond them, higher still, that same wind scours the wild upland of Exmoor. An enduring landscape where the seasons and the weather dictate life's rhythm. Tucked in the lee of the moor, snuggles the market town of South Moulton. It's home to Rob and Sarah Taylor, and they wouldn't choose any other spot on the planet. Best place on earth. Devon is heaven. Great people, great atmosphere. If you're ever in trouble up through this valley, somebody will help you. Now in their 50s, the Taylors have always been steeped in rural life and have long dreamed of owning their own patch of land. Oh, oh, oh. Setting up a farm is a costly affair, and usually a family concern passed down from one generation to the next. For the Taylors, their own small corner of Devon seemed forever out of reach, until a family friend left them Bidbrook Farm, a 23-acre small holding. We're over the moon. We thought we'd just be permanently working for everybody else and not actually own stock as such, but we've got cattle, sheep and chickens. <laughs> the livestock here are a means of bringing in much needed revenue, but their real passion rests farther up the hills. Exmoor ponies. For centuries, Exmoor ponies were the staple workhorse for both industry and transport. Seemingly rendered redundant by mechanization and the motor car, their population has drastically declined. Today, the tailors are preparing for what might become an uphill struggle. Packing up the picnic, I'm just going to take cold drinks. Is that OK? They're heading off and rounding up a herd of ponies running free across the moor to get them ready for the show season. We've got to go up common, set up the pens, and then round up the ponies, get them out into the pens, check everything over. Challenge is today. We can't find the ponies. Yeah, me and Sarah will fall out and have a good argument. you also got the cattle out there now, so they might intervene. Yeah, yeah the cattle are out there. Um, we might have a bit of fun with them. It's a complex exercise needing clear communication and all the precision of a military operation. Hiya. 
One, two, three, one, two, three. While Rob will be field marshal for the roundup. Shall we get your quad out and put the quads in there out of the way so we can build the pen? Yeah. Sarah is chief of staff for capture and containment. If you put them with the gates, Elsa, that'll be good. Thank you. As her troops start assembling a pop-up paddock just off the moor. This is when it's bees like a honeypot. We've got to get this done so we can get it up and ready and done, get them in, and then we won't be quite blocking the road for so long. Hopefully, but yeah. it's like you see, all hands on deck. Many hands may like work. That'll be all right. I do hate these gates. Just lift your end up, that's it. Get all the ponies into the big pen. Pick out what we want into here, then into the trailer. Hopefully. All set. Go, go, go. Oh, please let it work. Please let it work. Stockade standing ready. It's time for Rob and his squad to try and track down the ponies. It's rough, bumpy terrain. Now up over. And even with a quad bike, it's heavy going. How far out over are you? We're here just above the crossing. There's cattle in the top corner of 60 acres now. Oh. We can't actually see the ponies there. <laughs> The cattle have now come up into the field at 60 acres where they were and they've pushed the ponies out, which in a way is good. Yeah. Things look like they might be going to plan. They're coming this way, which is a bonus, not going away from us. Rob and his quad bikers need to mind read the pony's movements. As they corral the herd towards the gate and off the moor. They're quite chilled and happy in here. These pens are great because you can give them as much space, but if they kick them, they're not going to hurt themselves. If they shove their leg out through, they're not going to hurt themselves, but they are a godsend to us. Yeah, yeah, it didn't go too bad at all. I've known it a lot worse. Come on, Peg. Walk on. on. Get up. Go on. Go on. Go. Go on. They have the pick of the ponies they want for the show season safely off the moor. Those two aren't going to actually hurt stood in there for They're a minute. Right. Later in Devon and Cornwall. Come on, in, girls. Come on, you've got to go in the trailer. Rob and Sarah focus on the farm, raising much needed cash to keep it going. These three girls are off to market. Um, we'll be sorry to see them go, but we need the money as well. Every day in my job is completely different. And Lundy Warden Dean gets a closer look at the island's new arrivals. This is where pretty much everyone who comes to Lundy who wants to see seabirds comes to go. In particular, our puffins. the North Devon coastline, where lush green fields give way abruptly to steep and perilous cliffs. A fiercely fought frontier where landlubbers and seafarers have constantly battled. But this isn't where Devon ends. Flung far out to sea, 12 miles from the mainland's last buttress, Lundy is a three-mile craggy shard of granite jutting out of the racing tide. With its sheer cliffs and treacherous shoreline, this remote Devonian outpost was once the hangout for some of the most ruthless vagabonds ever to board a boat. A 
And today, it is still the launch pad for audacious piratical raids. Plundering the rich fishing grounds off the Devon coast, seabirds like puffins and guillemots make the most of Lundy's status as a marine conservation zone. And the man lucky enough to be its warden is Dean Jones. Oh, it's gorgeous out today. It's a pocket-sized community of fewer than 30, and Dean's morning catch-up with staff takes place in the one and only municipal meeting space, the pub. Does anyone want any more brown? There's two more pieces here. This is the hub of the island, really. And every day, yeah, the staff get together, half nine or 10 o'clock, and we have toast together. Um, so this is the Lundy family. Lots of smiley faces today. <laughs> While most of the staff on the island look after the thousands of tourists who visit each year, Dean's main job is to take care of what beckons them there in the first place. The island's teeming wildlife. Every day in my job is completely different, and being in an island setting, you know, you kind of have to wear many hats. So yeah, it's never a dull day here. This morning, Dean is heading to a critically important site. The breakneck cliffs on the island's western flank boast one of Devon's best-loved puffin colonies. And protecting these pint-sized sea parrots is one of Dean's most important tasks. This is a stunning Jenny's Cove, and this is where pretty much everyone who comes to London who wants to see seabirds comes to go, in particular, our puffins. It was probably the Vikings who coined the name Lundy. In Old Norse, it means Puffin Island. But the crag's little namesakes have had to weather a rough and rocky passage. They used to get poached quite a lot. 9,000 puffins were taken just for the feather trade, you know, in the early 1800s. But the main problem we were having here was rats, which would go into the burrows, eat the young chicks and eat the eggs. In the year 2000, the puffin population had collapsed from a high of many thousands to fewer than 20 birds. Conservationists spent years eliminating rats from the island. Puffin numbers are now steadily increasing, but Dean must prevent the dreaded rodent's return at all costs. So these are some of the monitoring stations we have here. These are some of the larger ones. We've got 70 of these boxes around the island. With visitor numbers growing each year, the risk of a rat raid increases also. Fingers crossed there's not going to be a rat in here waiting on us when we open it. Luckily, there's nothing there at the moment. What this is is pretty much just candle wax and chocolate. If we do have a potential rat or mouse that will visit this box, hopefully it'll chew down on this little wax block here and it'll leave specific marks on this wax. You know, it only takes one breeding female here to completely repopulate the island. And they'll start tackling the seabird eggs and seabird chicks. But luckily, We've got no teeth marks on this wax, so that's happy days for me. For Dean, constant vigilance is key. For now, the puffins are thriving. But for some of Lundy's other feathered celebrities, the future looks far less favorable. On the North Devon mainland, near South Moulton, farmers Rob and Sarah Taylor are making the most of their dream come true. Go on, girls. Working hard to fix up their inherited small holding. The house hadn't been touched for 40 years. Now we just keep trying to improve it every day. Obviously, you'd always like it to go a bit faster, but time and money permit. Never enough of either. I could do with 36 hours in a day sometimes. Yes, yeah, I could do with 36 grand in the bank account. <laughs> <laughs> They're counting their blessings. But farming life is tough, 
So they must work flat out to pay the bills. Come on, girls. Come on, you've got to go in the trailer, quickly. Today, they're heading off flogging their three heifers. These three girls are off to market. Um, we'll be sorry to see them go. We've um, raised them since they're little calves. They've been lovely and quiet, good to handle, never given us any trouble, but we need the money as well. Um, Price-wise, you just got to wait and see what the trade is on the day. We do need the money to pay for the tractor. Yeah. And things like that. And so how, how life is, I'm afraid. Is. Yeah. It's not going to be this easy, surely. I wouldn't have thought so. Surely. Rock and roll, then. OK. Rob and Sarah are carting their cattle 17 miles north to Cutcombe Market on Exmoor. This market's been going for over a century. When livestock were brought on the hoof, trundling over the moorland. Oh, they're coming. Come on in, darlings. Out you go. Good girls. Go on in. Good girls. It's all a bit new, isn't it? Yeah. It's time for the tailor's young heifers to enter the ring. And at just over 300 pounds a head, they're barely breaking even. Like, no, but... about, well, about 50 pound head less than what we wanted, ideally. Yeah, but, but they've gone. We haven't yeah. got to feed them. No. A tear come in my eye because it's sad to see them go, but they've all gone together. Yeah. Saying goodbye to treasured livestock is part and parcel of farming life. And in order to bring their inherited smallholding into the 21st century, the only way to fund it. The tailors live very much in the here and now. But Bidbrook Farm also provides a window into times long past. Stuff here that's been 40, 50, if not more years here. It's like all this old metalwork. There's bits here that horses have used for towing plows and things. We inherited this as well. A workshop full of hundreds of years of stuff. <laughs> Oh, there's just all sorts in here. We come in and we want something, and nine times out of ten we can find it. There's an old seed fiddle that they used to use for sowing the seed on the fields when before, and you do it like that, and the seed comes out. But there's amazing things in here. There's old cigar boxes that have come from all of little tiny locks on them that open up, and then you find a treasure trove, pocket knives, tea strainers, all sorts of things like that. The history of the farm is in here. You ju we just find something new every time we come in. For Sarah and Rob, the farm is not the only strand of heritage that they're keeping alive. With the cream of their Exmoor ponies off the moor, they now need to focus their attention on the show season. Later, in Devon and Cornwall... We don't tend to get much traffic on these roads, other than the odd sheep. Dean heads off to the western coast of Lundy, hopeful of a new brood of kittiwakes. And it'd be really, really sad if we were to see this wonderful seabird disappear from Lundy. The Cornish coast has probably got more wrecks per mile of coastline than anywhere else in the world. And diver Mark sails off in search of a buried shipwreck. 
exploring the unknown. It's just, it's just that excitement as you're going down. Standing in splendid isolation off the north coast of Devon, Lundy Island is one of the county's most important and fragile ecosystems. And for island warden Dean Jones, this is his busiest and most unpredictable time of year. The weather is truly in charge here. Mother Nature dictates what we do on a daily basis. We don't tend to get much traffic on these roads, other than the odd sheep like we have now. And I swear it gets a bit bumpy, lads. As well as for its Lundy ponies and rare breed Soe sheep that graze the rough pasture, the island is either home or a migration route stop-off point for 140 different species of birds each year. While Dean's seen a healthy rise in the island's puffin population, the number of kittiwakes has been tumbling. And now breeding season's back in full swing. He's hoping this elegant gull species can recover. We know from full island counts, you know, that the majority of our seabirds have actually been thriving since we've got rid of the rats here on the island. Unfortunately, the kittiwake is one bird that's kind of doing the opposite. Their numbers as a whole are dropping here on Lundy and elsewhere in the UK. They, they do have a lot of problems finding food now due to climate change, overfishing. Pollution as well is a big factor affecting a lot of our seabirds here. And it'd be really, really sad if we were to see this wonderful seabird disappear from Lundy. But to Dean's delight, the future suddenly seems a lot chirpier. So we've got loads. Chicks everywhere. Fantastic. We don't really know where a lot of these birds go once they leave, maybe in the near future, if we can get some really nice technology on these birds, find out where they're going, it might actually aid in the conservation of the species on the island. For centuries, Lundy's isolated position has made it a perfect refuge for both wildlife and people. And as Dean devotes his days to trying to protect this Devon gem, he's well aware of both his responsibility and his good fortune. It has to be the best office in the world, just to get away from the hustle and bustle of mainland life. And I'm really, really lucky to be able to come down here and, well, sit here and watch seabirds and call this my job. Yeah, it's gonna be very, very difficult for me to ever leave this island, I think. Cornish coast, a shoreline of romantic beauty, rugged, powerful. And seen through the eyes of generations of mariners, it's a perilous seaboard that commands profound respect. Heading in from the bustling port of Falmouth, across the deep water of the Carrick Roads, is Myler Harbour a haven for pleasure and fishing boats alike. Mark Milburn is a shipwreck hunter. And for him, Myla Harbour is the perfect place to launch expeditions to uncover stories of Cornwall's maritime past. Oh, it's, been, it's been a port since Roman times. We know the Phoenicians came to trade for tin, the Romans come to trade for tin. Boats have been coming here forever. It's sort of a diver's dream, because a lot of them are, are relatively shallow, so they're within most people's abilities. There's no guarantee what people might discover lurking beneath the brine. If you want to start getting your kit together... The one thing is certain. Every dive will be different.
most satisfying thing at the end of a, of a dive is when we're on the way home and I can hear the back deck buzzing. It's that sense of satisfaction. It's slower when they get older. All right. For Mark, sharing his passion with others is a means to an end, a way to keep the boat afloat so that he can explore new wrecks himself. So it's a short journey, probably only take five, ten minutes maximum. Just off Milo lie the sunken remnants of the Queen, another tragic story from Cornwall's catalogue of shipwreck and loss of life. Along with friend and archaeologist David Gibbons, Mark is planning a descent to the depths of the wreck. She was bringing back um, invalid soldiers and their families from the Peninsular War in 1814 at the end of the campaign against Napoleon in Spain. This quest is a first for David. We know there's other wrecks there, so we never know what we, we might find. I'm very much looking forward to it. This is actually really exciting. It's going to be good seeing something new. Mark and David are heading from Milo Harbour towards Trefusis Point, a section of treacherous rocks in the Fal estuary, where the Queen dragged her anchor and went ashore two centuries ago. Exploring the unknown, it's just, it's just that excitement as you're going down. <laughs> Seeing possibly something no one's seen before, or we might not see anything. After scouring the seabed for clues, Mark and David successfully locate what remains of the Queen. The Cornish coast has probably got more wrecks per mile of coastline than anywhere else in the world. So many not been found. More than 200 people perished here on a wild and snowy night in sight of the safe harbour. Even after more than two centuries underwater, there's still treasure to be found. Pieces of old pottery. No idea what that was. It's another bit of brass. The uh, nice thing here is touching history again, isn't it? It's always great to find something new. You know, whatever it is, it might not have been touched or seen by another person in 200 years. The hall may be small, but the knowledge they've gained, invaluable. It's always good to kind of see something new. Every time I do this, it just feels like the first time. Little by little, dive by dive, Mark and David are bringing to light more of Cornwall's submerged secrets. Any day underwater is better than any day in the office. The search to recover missing fragments from history will take them farther and deeper along this remarkable stretch of coast. South Moulton in North Devon. Daily toil on the farm never stops, but Rob and Sarah's real zeal is for the West Country's upland native Exmoor ponies. Breeding them, showing them, and protecting this beautiful breed from dying out. It's keeping the numbers out there, keeping the numbers up. We're just so passionate about them, they've got to be on Exmoor but we just enjoy them and we like to see them out on the moors. Yeah. They've run ponies on the moor for a decade. Oh, booby boo. And after successfully rounding up their showcase specimens... What are you doing? Hello. They're preparing for the high point of their year, showing season. Go on. <laughs> hey! And must get them prinked and primed, ready to parade in front of the judge. What we're going to do now is get them right up to go into the show ring. Feet painted, mud off of them, bridles fitted, full-blown what yeah. it's going to be. Good boys. Good boys. People see them in herds and think there's a lot of ponies out there, but there isn't. Wolfie is a descendant from a rare bloodline. The other two aren't. 
but they're bloodlines that aren't greatly represented. So we just want to keep them going and keep them alive. After months of running wild on the moors, the ponies, Wolfie, Gorse and Dicky need to be reintroduced to the bridle and bit. Good boy. Good boy. And their coats and hooves give them some extra sheen. I love the smell of this. Hoof grease and hoof oil do have some benefits to hooves, but there's ponies on the moor that never get this done and they're surviving and it happens. It's only really for show. A bit like ladies in their nail polish. Come on, then. By presenting the machos, Rob and Sarah are doing their bit to keep the ponies in the public eye and prove that as well as a history, these gorgeous creatures still have a role to play in the future. It shows everybody that the ponies on Exmoor that do live on the moor can do things. Not only do they conservation graze, but they can be shown, they can be ridden, they do jumping, dressage. Gorse and Wolfie have been to small shows before, but it's Dickie's first time in the ring. And as he's put through his paces, it's clear he's a long way from being a polished performer as yet. On his looks, he's got a damn good chance, but if we can't get him trotting, he might not do so well, but you can't tell. You can't get in front of him, you see. He can do it, he can do it, but Stand. it's just time. Stand. Stand. Later, in Devon and Cornwall... I don't know that we'll be the judges' cup of tea today, but there you go. Rob and Sarah drive their pride and joy to Dunster in the hope of a big win. Good boys, aren't you? Travel well, which is a good omen, yes! Hopefully it'll be a great day. Morning! Oh, staff turned up, better late than never. And Fisherman Phil flogs his catch at the festival. There we are, all right, there we go. At Bidbrook Farm in North Devon, Rob and Sarah Taylor are hoping their young Exmoor ponies can rein in their wild side. Come along, boys. Oh, that worked, didn't it? They're taking the stars of the new generation to the Dunster Country Fair. Good lad. Yeah, it's all a bit different, I'm afraid. Steady then, boys. Good, Good boy. With three frisky ponies to transport, neighbours Pete and Tricia are on hand to help. Water's in, hay's in, chairs are in, gazebo's in. That's it, I think. No gin. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Dunster Country Fair has been running for 42 years, and with a discerning following for native ponies, local reputations are at stake. I don't know that we'll be the judges' cup of tea today, but there you go. I must not get wound up about it. Getting a bit nervous about it, really. The journey to Dunster takes the team right through the heart of Exmoor, where for most of the year the ponies run free. Good morning and welcome to the fourth Checkers County Fair. Good boys, aren't you? Travel well. Which is a good omen, yes! Hopefully it'll be a great day. Needing to make an impression, appearance is everything. Can you do my tie in a minute, please? Yes. A lot of people wear light trousers because they say it shows off the pony's legs. This is Dickie's first outing under show conditions. But it's a bit overwhelming, even for the seasoned competitors. Whoa, whoa, stand. Stand. Silly bugger. Gorse has been a numpty at the moment. Dickie's big day, he's in before the other two. We'll see what happens. I can't guarantee we'll trot, but we'll have a go. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. 
Once in the ring and Dickie soon proving a handful for Sarah. This is trotting that's going to let him down, I think. No, 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 don't run over the judge. That's not a good idea. Sorry, lady. As soon as you get going, he shoots off to the side. He's looking good. So he wasn't one you bred? Oh. With all the ponies now on their best behaviour, Judge Stephanie is ready to pick her winners. Now this is a crunch. Are we going to get the third or are we going to have the fourth? Sarah, brilliant. So we're in the ribbons. We, we had to demote him because he won't get the Yeah, very happy. If he'd trotted, I reckon he'd have won that. We liked him very much because you could tell he was all boy. Obviously, he let himself down because he wouldn't trot, but that's understandable. He's, you know, it's all very new and there's so much going on here. Well done. It's a great result, and Dickie's clearly got bags of potential. But now it's time for old hands Wolfie and Gorse to show how it's really done. This is into the yearling class now. Dickie was in the two and three year old, and now they've gone into the yearling class. Sarah's got Gorse, and Trisha's got Wolfie in there. Are we going to leave the boy first? Oh, that is looking good. Gorse has been pulled into first. Now, that I wasn't expecting. Bloody marvellous. Very happy. And Gorse goes on to even greater honours, achieving reserve young stock champion. Well done, you little man. For the tailors, showing Exmoor ponies is a labour of love. Oh, it's wonderful. Couldn't have asked for anything better. I'll cry in a minute. It's a way of keeping pony numbers strong and healthy. Good boy. Good That's a boy. very good lad. And today's Hall of Rosettes is a bonus on their mission to protect and nurture this ancient and enchanting breed. Everybody had a rosette. Yeah. And of all the people to get reserve Reserved. champion, it yeah. had to be little Gorse. Gorsey. He's that emotional. We bred that. Yeah. We bred Something that. Something special. Something out in this world it is. At Newquay in Cornwall, the Fish Festival is upon them. And for fisherman Phil Trebilcock, helping to pilot proceedings, it has always been a family affair. Morning! Oh, staff's turned up. Better late than never. Son Aaron and daughter-in-law Natalie are festival stalwarts. 75% is all local stuff. Well, we're in our um, 17th year now, and uh, it's come a very long way since 2003, when we literally threw it together in three or four weeks. Not long now, and Philip will join the singing crew for a rousing shout to finish things off properly. But before any of that, he's got to flog his Cornish catch. Two oysters and one glass of wine. Yep, no problem. There we are. All right, there we go. Sold out crabs and scallops and oysters, so. This will go now, last hour and a half, this will be gone. But now he's looking forward to making an even bigger splash on the festival stage. We're just going to clean up now, finish it all up, get changed, and we'll do a bit of singing finale. A couple of points, we'll sort everything out, you know, and um, a lot of the songs written by a man in Cornwall and we're pleased to sing them. A lot of heritage in Cornwall. The mining, the fishing, the farming, and all we're doing really is custodians of looking after this. 
I remember down here, seven, eight, nine years of age, and now I'm just turned a bloody pensioner. But my kids are coming on. A lot of families in the harbour here got kids, but they're going to carry on all the heritage, the fishing, and all that goes with it. And these sort of festivals bring people together. It's a community event.